Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to my approach to acute kidney injury or AKI. So you're going to come across many different approaches um, as you go through internal medicine and it's really important that you figure out what works for you. This following video is my interpretation of AKI and there's a lot of information so I'll try and do it step by step. So to start with the definition, AKI can be defined as an acute decrease in renal function as measured by GFR or glomerular filtration rate. If you remember from your academic years, we measure the kidney function in GFR, but we use a surrogate uh, value, so that's uh, serum creatinine. And the normal serum creatinine is below 106, or I like to remember the value 100. And AKI can also be defined as an increase in the creatinine by one and a half times above baseline or an absolute in increase of uh, 26 or more within 48 hours. And often in clinical medicine, we're not too uh, worried about those exact definitions. We really just look at the number and if it's a significant increase, um, then we kind of, kind of call it AKI. So um, the differentiation between acute and chronic is arbitrary. We usually say acute is a uh, decrease in the creatinine over days to weeks and chronic as a decrease over months to years. So the differential for AKI is huge but it's the most important thing about this topic. It's what you're going to be asked. So you need to keep the major categories in mind. So the three you need to know are pre-renal, and there's renal, also known as intrinsic, and then post-renal. And when all is said and done, you should remember that the most common causes of AKI are ATN, or acute tubular, tubular necrosis, which we will talk about. And there's pre-renal causes, also acute on chronic renal failure, and also obstruction. So the first group is pre-renal acute kidney injury. So pre-renal is the most common cause of uh, AKI, and it's often reversible. The pathophysiology is that it's a process that results in a decrease in renal perfusion, and that leads to a decrease um, in the GFR and a decreased clearance of toxins. And tubular function is preserved, but it leads to ischemia um, and ATN if untreated. So within pre-renal, we have a differential. There can be hypovolemia. So this can be due to hemorrhage or fluid loss. That includes vomiting and diarrhea or diuretic use. Also third spacing and insensible losses. Then we have hypotension, which is often due to shock and edematous states like congestive heart failure, like cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome. And then we have renal ischemia, so renal artery stenosis or hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, hepatorenal is a complication of chronic liver disease. And last is anything that modifies the autoregulation of the kidneys, which includes drugs like NSAIDs, uh, calcineurin inhibitors, um, ACEs and ARBs as well. So the next major category on your list, um, even before renal kidney disease, should be post-renal causes of uh, AKI because these are more common and thus are higher yield. So in these post-renal processes, what happens is there is a urinary tract obstruction and that leads to increased tubular pressure and a decreased GFR. The blood supply to the kidneys and the parenchyma is intact, but prolonged obstruction can damage the kidneys and lead to irreversible uh, renal injury. So in terms of the etiology, you think about anything that could cause an obstruction. So there's BPH or ure urethral obstruction, and then there's obstruction of a solitary kidney. There's ureteral obstruction, which often will need to be bilateral, and then nephrolithiasis or kidney stones any obstructing sort of uh, neoplasm, and also retroperitoneal fibrosis. Okay, so on first presentation of the patient with AKI, you need to figure out if it's pre-renal or post-renal. You do the investigations and initial management, which we're going to talk about. And only if things aren't completely resolved, 
then we do the workup for the intrinsic uh, or renal causes. So intrinsic AKI is a bit more complicated. There's a really big differential and memorizing the conditions is more of a junior resident level task. So continue watching for the approach um, on intrinsic AKI, or you can click on the button which is going to pop out right now to skip to the next section. Okay, so intrinsic AKI. The pathophys of this is essentially damage to one of the compartments of the, uh, the kidneys. So it's either going to be the tubule or the glomerulus or the interstitium or the vascular network that surrounds the nephron. So the first classification is tubular, and we call this um, the ac acute uh, tubular necrosis, or ATN. And um, it can be split up into ischemic ATN, which is due to any process that's decreasing renal blood flow. So there's hypotension, there's dehydration, or sepsis, and essentially all causes of severe pre-renal AKI can cause ischemic ATN, and also NSAIDs. Then we have nephrotoxic ATN. This is often due to certain drugs, including aminoglycosides, which is a kind of antibiotic, and also radiocontrast. Then there's tubular obstruction, and this is due to uric acid. There's uh, calcium oxalate, um, acyclovir, methotrexate, and also myeloma light chains. And ATN, one of the features is that it's persistent even after fluid re repletion which makes it different uh, from pre-renal AKI. And next we have glomerular disease. So there's two large branches within glomerular disease. There's nephrotic and nephritic. And each of these have the characteristic triads which are worth memorizing. So for nephrotic, the triad is um, edema. There's proteinuria of more than 3 grams per day with hypoalbuminemia. And the third thing is hyperlipidemia. Some things we add on extra is uh, lipid, lipiduria and also a hypercoagulable state, which may or may not be present. And then there's the nephritic triad, which is hematuria, there's hypertension, and oliguria, um, AKI. So back to nephrotic syndrome. There's four main uh, conditions here. There's FSGS, or focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. And this is probably the one you should remember. It's the most common in adults and therefore relevant to internal. But the other one is not uncommon. There's MCD, or minimal change disease. And this is uh, pretty common in younger patients. So it's more of a pediatric uh, disease. And then the other ones, there's MGN and MPGN type 1. And I'm not going to talk about these any more than that. So then moving on to nephritic. So nephritic, we can split it up into different types of processes. There's autoimmune, there's posse immune, and then there's immune complex. So within the autoimmune category, we have uh, good pastures. And this is a a disease where the body makes antibodies against the glomerular basement membrane or GBM and the characteristic features here are glomerular nephritis and also pulmonary hemorrhage. The next group is posse immune and in here we have Wegener's granulomatosis also known as GPA or granulomatosis with polyangiitis. This one usually occurs in older adults and Caucasians, and they present with constitutional symptoms and ENT manifestations like uh, chronic sinusitis, rhinorrhea, nasal discharge, and they can also have pulmonary disease, hemoptysis, and renal disease. And then we have Churg-Strauss, and that's also known as allergic granulomatosis, and it's characterized by small or medium vessel vasculitis. And differentiating these two conditions within the posse immune category are done, uh, obviously, by clinical features, but also lab tests. So Wegener's is positive for C. anca and Trugstrauss for P. anca, and these are both immunofluorescence tests. And then we have the anti-PR3 for Wegener's and the anti-MPO for Trugstrauss, and these are both ELISA tests. The next category we have is immune complex, 
And so in here, we have um, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, or PSGN. And this is the most common acute nephritis. It occurs in mostly um, young and old populations. The presentation is about 10 days post-strep throat. The lab test that we commonly order here is the ASOT, or the antibody titer to streptolysin O. That's often elevated, and we'll see a low complement C3 as well. Lupus is also on the differential, so the mnemonic is SOAP Brain MD, and I won't go over them now, but uh, you need 4 out of 11 of these um, for lupus. And the tests that we do are ANA and anti-DS DNA, among others here. Um, also, hepatitis B and C and cryoglobulin also fall into this category. There's respective tests there. And last, we have IgA nephropathy, which can sometimes be found in under the autoimmune category, but I think it's more accurate to put it under the immune complex section here. Um, the systemic form of IgA nephropathy is known as HSP, or Henoch-Shanlian purpura, and the tetrad that we should remember is um, palpable purpura, arthralgia, abdominal pain, and renal disease. Uh, HSP is actually more common in children, so it's something you'll talk about during your peds rotation. Okay, so we're done with glomerulonephritis. Just to recap, the two main categories are nephrotic and nephritic. You should try and re memorize the triads for each of them. And then also know that the nephritic category is separated into autoimmune, posseimmune, and immune complex. So moving on, we have the third group uh, within uh, intrinsic AKI, and that's vascular disease. So this includes um, HUS, TTP, and DIC, as well as thromboemboli, thrombosis, and cholesterol emboli. And then there's large vessel vasculitis, which includes polyarteritis nodosa and Takayasu, which is a really uh, rare form of large vessel vasculitis. And lastly, we have interstitial disease. So there's a condition called allergic interstitial nephritis, and that's a delayed two-week hypersensitivity reaction to medications, often um, NSAIDs and antibiotics. And also systemic infection and pyelonephritis can also cause interstitial AKI. So that's it for the intrinsic AKI differential. Okay, so now we're going to continue on with the general AKI approach, now that we have an idea of the differential diagnosis. So when you ask for a history, uh, aside from the general internal medicine history, the things that you can ask that uh, will help with AKI are to ask about uh, GI or renal losses, ask about any history of oral intake problems, um, trauma or hemorrhage, any abnormalities with their urine, so are they uh, having chematuria or frothy urine, uh, any peripheral edema, any rash, and symptoms of uremia, which includes nausea and vomiting, fatigue, uh, pruritus, and dyspnea, and any metallic taste in their mouth, and anorexia as well. For past medical history, ask about anything to do that, that has an involvement with the kidneys, so diabetes, vascular disease, hypertension, and any renal disease, um, stones, cancers, and autoimmune disease. Uh, medication history, uh, ask specifically about uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, aminoglycosides, antibiotics, and radiocontrast. Next, we have the physical exam. So volume status is really important. We look for high volume status, and we do that by looking at the JVP and also looking for peripheral edema. The, those point toward volume overload. And then in the case of low volume status, so we check the postural vital signs, uh, looking for a low JVP, sunken eyes, dry axilla and mucous membranes, and longitudinal furrows on the tongue, all of those point towards a low volume status. And then on the general exam, we can look for signs of lupus. Um, we can look at their skin, joints, oral ulcers, um, any signs of uremia, like a pericardial rub, and asterixis as well. And the urinalysis, uh, if you ask a nephrologist, is a part of the renal physical exam. Um, 
Okay, so we're moving up to the investigations so we can talk about the urinalysis. So in the urinalysis, um, for a pre-renal urine, you'll often have normal-looking urine, um, and it'll be a bland urinalysis with some hyaline casts. So you can see a picture of those here. And this is in contrast to the urinalysis in ATN, which is muddy brown, and you'll see granular casts and possibly uh, epithelial casts, which I haven't shown here. And there are many additional casts that are associated with renal or intrinsic disease. You can look up, look them up if you're interested. And the last thing is that uh, the amount of protein and blood in the urine, which can be found by urinalysis or um, the dipstick, that can suggest either nephrotic or nephritic syndrome, as um, I've mentioned here. Uh, urine chemistry is a separate test so that you have to order. Um, and I've outlined here what a pre-renal urine chemistry looks like. The one that you should probably know is the uh, fractional excretion uh, of sodium. And this is just because it's often asked on exams. Um, moving on, you do need to follow the BUN and the creatinine um, to monitor for worsening or improvement in kidney function. And these other tests, uh, you'd order them depending on the clinical scenario. So you can do an, a renal ultrasound uh, to look at the size asymmetry between the kidneys and also look for hydronephrosis in post-renal um, AKI. You can also do renal arteriography. And then there's, um, you can do a CT abdo or pelvis also um, looking for hydronephrosis. And you can do a workup for infection. Uh, that's for, you can do a urine CNS, blood cultures, chest x-ray, etc. Um, and also a workup for intrinsic AKI, as we outlined in the differential earlier. Um, often you will need a renal biopsy uh, for a more definitive answer to the diagnosis. And the lab tests were also outlined in that part of the video. Um, the last thing we have here is treatment. So general points of treatment for AKI, regardless of etiology, we need to discontinue the offending drugs if possible, adjust the medication dosages for renal function, and correct the fluid imbalances and also the electrolyte imbalances, do daily lights and supplement them PRN. And then there's dialysis if uh, they're refractory to medical management. The options would be uh, peritoneal or hemodialysis. And just for completeness sake, here is the mnemonic for indications for dialysis, so AEIOU. Um, there's uh, metabolic acidosis, electrolyte abnormalities, especially hyperkalemia, intoxication with the following uh, substances here. There's fluid overload and uremia and the complications. So then there's the therapies uh, tailored to the etiology. So with pre-renal, we often will fluid resuscitate them until they're euvolemic and their blood pressure is stable. For intrinsic AKI, we need to do supportive therapy for ATN. We remove the offending agents, uh, do a trial of diuretics if they're volume overloaded, uh, do dialysis if they meet the criteria for it, and of course treat the underlying disorder. And then with post-renal AKI, we we'll often will empirically insert a catheter to de decompress their urinary tract and consider a urology consult. Okay, so that's it for the approach to AKI. Thanks for sticking around to the end. And click any of the boxes that are going to show up right now to review the specific section of the video that you might want to go over again. And uh, email me any questions and feedback at approach to internal medicine at gmail.com. And please like and subscribe to my channel to keep up to date with uh, the videos that I do in the future. Thanks a lot.